I'll just scroll down to show that below the maps, there is a whole lot of information about how to use the web page and also some links to other useful pages. As they say, when in doubt, try reading the instructions. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of it down there. But um, a visual dem demonstration is what we're here for tonight, so I'll uh, get on with that. The first thing I was going to say is, um, if anyone's got any colour blindness, or just a preference for different colours, you can actually choose your own colours for the dots on the maps. And you do that using this settings button where my cursor pointer is hovering. I won't describe how to use it right now. We might have time for it later. I will just click on that to show you the colour choice display, which hopefully you can now see, Steve. Yep, see that. Okay, well, I might have time to describe that later, but anyway, I've just moved down to the close this panel button and I'll close it again. So why do we need distribution maps? All kinds of reasons, um, so that you can see where a species has been recorded, whether you have found it in a new location, whether it's a normal time of year or unusually early or late, to see changes in distribution over time, whether it's increasing or decreasing, et cetera, et cetera. And by having published maps, that encourages people to send in their records, especially when you've recorded something in a square where it wasn't previously recorded. Why did I make the maps? Well. Um, I have done butterfly mapping in the past, and once I changed my attention to moths, I wanted moth maps, and I thought the best way of getting what I wanted for my own use was to offer, and build, offer to build and make them available to everyone. And I started doing that in 2010. The maps were a whole lot simpler then, they've evolved quite a lot since then and the technology I use for them has changed as well. Now, when the maps first load, you see the species density map. Or if you happen to load them round about Christmas, you've got a Christmas tree instead, but that, that was only a temporary thing. For each two kilometer by two kilometer square on the map, the total number of species recorded is coded by dot size and colour. These two kilometre by two kilometre squares are known as tetrads because their area is four square kilometres. There are several ways of selecting which species to show on the maps. And the maps are stored in, in order, in UK checklist order. Um, that is the checklist that was published, oh, about eight years ago now, the Agassi, Bevan and Heckford checklist, or ABH as it's known, which um, supersedes the Bradley checklist, which was last published around 2000. You don't actually need a, to have a copy of the checklist you can just use the species names to select the maps. There's a, slide, a slider bar at the top of the maps here. That is one way of selecting species. It works its way through the checklist. You can click and drag the slider and just below it, hopefully you're seeing the names keep changing on a couple of lines just below the slider. Yeah. Steve, are you seeing this? Yeah, seeing that, yeah. I'll uh, put that back at the start again for the moment. Um, you can click and drag it to about where in the checklist you want to be, and when you release the slider, it'll show the it'll show the map. So if I drag it across to, oh, let's see, where shall, what shall I get? Uh, 
Um, oh, six belted clearing. So I've just released the slider and, and it shows the map. The two buttons to the left of the slider where I'm circling the cursor now, they just move the species backwards or forwards by one in the checklist. So I can go back by one, clicking on that, click on it again, click on it again, and you, you'll see the species changing. Or if I click on the right hand one, it goes up by one each time. When the pointer is over the map box, and all kinds of information appears, but I'll um, try and avoid that. I'll keep the pointer over the top right hand corner of the map box so as not to distract you with other things. Now, if I use the mouse wheel, if I scroll down, it will move me down into the further into the checklist. If I scroll up, it'll go backwards. So I'm scrolling down now, one by one. Or I can scroll back. This demonstrates how quickly the species changes. There's no database to interact with. Um, 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 um. Mostly, however, you'll probably just select species by en entering their name. You do that in the box where the cursor is moving around now. It's changed from a pointer to the text entry cursor. Just below that, you'll see a choice between common names, scientific or food. Ignore the food for the moment. Normally, you'll be selecting a species by its common name or its scientific name. Personally, I use common names for the macros and scientific for the micros. I'll click on the common names because that's what you'll normally use. And you can type in part of the name and find, find the matches. And as it says just above, enter three or more characters from the name in the box below. So suppose we wanted to see the map for wood tiger. I could type in the whole of the wood and tiger and press find matches. Or I could enter just um, I've just typed in D space TIG. I'll find the matches for that. There was only the one. And there's the map for Wood Tiger. OK, normally you would type in Wood or Wood Tiger. If you type in Wood and find the matches, there are lots and lots of matches. They have all appeared in a choice box, a drop down box where the cursor is hovering now. Now here we have just hit a problem with screen sharing when using Zoom, or at least when using Zoom from a browser. If I open this drop down box by click on it, clicking on it, I now see three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twenty one. I now see fifteen names that have wood in it. Um, I gather from Steve that you don't see anything other than the top name Wood Lotus Pygmy. Is that right, Steve? That's correct, Guy, yes. So um, I could, for me, Wood Tiger is the 14th of the 15 names. And if I move the cursor down, I've got the cursor over what I can see as Wood Tiger. And if I click on that, the map appears. Um, you won't, won't have seen that, but when you're doing it for yourself, you will be able to do that. But another thing you can do with the cursor over this selection box is to scroll the mouse wheel. If you scroll it downwards, you go down the list. If you scroll it upwards, you go up the list and you wrap around the list at the end. So if I, this was the first in the list and if I go up, I've now got the last one in the list. If I go up again, I've got the penultimate one, which was Wood Tiger.
where the cursor is hovering now, you can see micros, macros, or both. That's a set of radio buttons. Whichever one you click, it cancels out whatever the other previous choice was. So if I click on macros and then find matches for wood, I've now only got four matches, which are wood carpet, wormwood pug, wood tiger, and wormwood. So if you're really only interested in the macros, um, then click on that, click on macros rather than leaving it on the default setting of both. And uh, that way you only, uh, you only get the macro names that match the text that you've put in. So once you have selected the species, what information do the maps show you? Well, by default, the maps show, show records at two kilometer scale for all years up to the latest one for which I have all the data, and that's currently 2020. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the very early, oldest record is that's in the database, but it might even be in the 1800s because some historical data was actually mappable to Tetrad. So the maps show dots according to years in four groups, each with its own type of dot. And the more recent dots hide the older ones. So where you see a solid red dot on the map, like I've got it now, where the pointer is over one, that is for 2020. And as you can see in this box, 2020, it says five against the dot, and there are five red dots on this map. So wood tiger, oh, sorry, wood carpet, we're showing the wood carpet map at the moment. Wood, wood carpet was found in five tetrads in 2020. Um, the next type of dot is solid blue. That's the year range 2010 to 2019. And you've got two numbers level with that in this box, 21 and 26. Well, 21 is the number of solid blue dots you can see on the map at the moment. But if I, um, if I did away with the display of the 2020 dots on the map, you'd actually see 26 blue dots. There's a drop down box here, which currently says map records from all the years to 2020. Now this has nine different options. Um, basically, it lets you choose which dots to show on the map. And at the moment, we've got all four types of dots showing. So you've got the solid red dot for 2020, got the blue dots for 2010 to 2019. You've got the black or dark gray dots for 2000 to 2009. And you've got the open dots for pre-2000 records. If I work my way through all nine different options, I'll do that by turning the mouse wheel very slowly. I've gone down by one and now we're just showing the pre-2020 records. So we've got the blue, black, and open dots. So now we've got 26 blue dots, and we've got 13 black dots and 11 open dots, which is the same as we had previously. I'll go down again, and it's now the pre-2010 records only. So now we've just got solid black dots and open dots, and we've got 18 solid black dots and 14 open dots. And the next option is just showing the pre-2000 records. So now we're seeing 17 pre-2000 tetrads for wood carpet. 
And the next option is just showing the 2000 to 2009 and, and not the earlier ones. The next option is just the 2010 to 2019 and not the earlier ones. The next option is the 2010 and nothing else. Sorry, the 2020 and nothing else. Apologies for accidentally scrolling the wheel a couple of times then. The next option is 2010 to 2020. The next option is 2000 to 2020. And then we get back to where we started for showing all of the dots for all of the years. So if you've got a species whose distribution is changed significantly over the years, then you can use this to see how much the change has been for its distribution. Right. Um, at the top of the map, the number you see there is the ABH checklist number that I talked about earlier. So 70.062 for wood carpet. The number in brackets is the previous checklist number, the Bradley checklist number. So 1739 for wood carpet. Then you get the scientific name. You know, I try and keep these scientific names up to date um, with the very latest changes as they are published. And in recent years, the ABH checklist has been updated in the January, February edition of the Entomologist Review Journal, um, which um, is one of the publications you can get if you join the Amateur Entomological Society or the Amateur Entomologist Society. Um, so um, some, of the, some of the names that you'll see on my maps if you've got a printed copy of the checklist, the name that you'll see on my map is different. That's because my map shows the latest change to the checklist, um, which has happened since it was published eight years ago. So below that, you have the common name, wood carpet in this case. Then you have the UK status. Now the UK status for the macro moths is taken from the published atlas that came out at the end of 2019 that you may or may not have um, splashed out and bought yourself a copy of, the atlas of the larger moths of Britain and Ireland. And these are um, coded um, with a couple of few letters LC stands for least concern, and that's one of the official classifications for species. Um, for the micros, I use the most recent assessment of their status is done using the old red list categories of scarcity. So those are um, rare, scarce A, scarce B, or notable A, notable B, they call the scarce A and scarce B or um, local or common, things like that. So if I drag the cursor to somewhere where it'll be a micro, Nemophora minimella, that's NB, so that's notable B, the equivalent of scarce B for a macro. The next one is Adela rare morella. You, you'll have seen that, it's common and, and its official rating was common. And so it goes on. Um, in square brackets after the, after the UK status, you'll see um, an indication of its verification coding. Um, micros have a national ver verification guidance document that was issued some years ago, 
and for the adults they're coded one to four um, for leaf mines there is a slightly different rating system and this is all explained in the text lower down on this page um, I'll quickly scroll down to where that is shown here. So micro Lepidoptera verification guidance. So the adult moths categories one to four, larval cases for the coleophorids mainly, C1 to C4, leaf miners, um, whether to accept the record, whether, whether the recorder will need to see the leaf or a good photograph of it, or whether the moth will need to be reared and maybe in some cases even dissected. And in some cases, um, the mine is actually unknown for some species. So, um, now between that and the, and the map, you'll see a year chart. The, um, the bars on this indicate the proportion of records that were received in that period. Each month I split into three periods, early, middle and late. And for every month, early is the 1st to the 10th, middle is the 11th to the 20th, and late is the 21st to the end of the month. The bar heights are proportional to the number of dated records and I've scaled it so that the period with the highest number of total records um, gets a bar that almost touches the text in the row above. But um, as you can see on this record, some of the bar is not actually solid black. Um, there are three different types of bar. Solid black is used for adults. Open orange, browny orange, is used for records of early stages. And open gray is used for records which the record didn't actually say it was whether it was adult or early stage, or at least the computer program didn't pick it up from the record as to whether it was adult or early stage. Um, you'll have seen some text appearing to the right. I'll, I'll, go, I'll describe all that a bit later. But for the moment, I'll go down to this area just immediately to the right of the map. You'll see at the bottom in tiny letters VC34, VC33, and other VCs. And the columns above indicate which years the species was recorded in VC34, which is Vice County 34, otherwise known as West Gloucestershire, um, VC33, Vice County 33, otherwise known as East Gloucestershire, and the other VCs are bits of other vice counties that are in present day administrative county of Gloucestershire. Now, I've been talking about vice counties, that may be double Dutch to some of you. Um, way, way back, um, I think in Victorian times, a botanist um, by the name of Watson, I think, um, invented a system of, of vice counties by cutting up the counties as they were in those days in the UK into approximately equal areas. So the larger counties got split into smaller chunks. Um, so for recording purposes, um, people used to use these vice counties and just have a national map with one dot covering the whole vice county basically. And for a lot of types of wildlife, that system of recording is still in use today. And if you have any books in the Moths and Butterflies of Great Britain and Ireland series, some of the maps in the older volumes of that series have Vice County distribution maps in them. Right. 
now. Um, as I was saying earlier, as you move the mouse over various places over this display, information appears to the right. If I just move the map down the VC34 column, then at the top, just to the right of the map, you should see some text appearing saying how many species were recorded in VC34 in the year corresponding to where the mouse cursor is. Yeah, because, you can see that guy. Yes, because as you can see, the mouse cursor, um, the year corresponds to um, the grid reference number on the map I've cheated and used. So the zero, zero I've used as 2020, the, the one zero I've used as 2010, the nine zero I've used as 1990 and so on. So anyway, that information appears to the right. Um, if I hover the cursor over the chart, you will see the number of records for the species in that period of the month. So in the area where the cursor is hovering now, look at that area as I go over the chart. So you'll see the number of records from mid-May 11th to the 20th is 195, of which 174 were adult records and 21 run specified. Um, I'll just try and find myself a species for which there will be some definite larval records or mine records. So I'll go to one of the leaf miners. So now you can see the chart for Stigmella aurella, a really common leaf miner on Bramble. So nearly all of the records for this species are charted here in orange um, because the records were supplied as leaf mines. Just a few of them were supplied as unspecified and a very few of them were supplied as adults. Um, the species is actually reasonably recognizable for as an adult, especially if you've reared it from the mine, which I have done on more than one occasion. Um, I did once rear a stigmella aurella from a mine which looked an absolute dead cert for this, this species, stigmella splendidissimella which has a splendid scientific name. And its mines are supposed to be very long and narrow compared to those of Stigmella aurella. And it more often uses various other species in the rosaceae rather than brambles. So when I found a long thin mine on strawberry with a caterpillar in it, and I put that in a pot and the caterpillar continued feeding and then came out and 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 it wove it spun itself a cocoon and pupated I thought great I'll get a, an adult splendid splendid Isimella from this but I didn't it was an adult aurela the two are very different anyway going back to the map for stigmella aurela so that's why there are a very few adult records because you can actually tell the adult when you've reared it from a mine. Otherwise, it is quite similar to quite a few other stigmellas. Um, some stigmellas can be identified by dissection, but you have to be very used to dissect, dissecting the, the tiniest of moths to um, be sure of identifying them by dissection. Right, well, um, so I've moved, moved the mouse pointer over the, over the VC area and I've moved it over the chart. Um, about time I put it over the map itself. So I'll move the pointer over the map. And the area to look at now 
as I move it around is this area to the top right of the map where I'm circling the cursor. So I'll go back to where I had put it. So we've got three rows there. So the top row says SO 900 to 919, 080 to 099, first and latest years 2012 and 2020. So that is telling us that the grid reference for records from this tetrad, if you give a, a full six figure grid reference accurate to 100 meters, then the first three digits are going to be in the range 900 to 919 and the last three digits are going to be in the range 080 to 099. For this species, the oldest record for that tetrad is 2012. The most recent record is 2020. Um, this is information that's not been available until quite recently. Um, John Spencer asked me if I could provide the most recent record data and I thought about it and decided, yes, I could quite easily. And then I thought about whether I could provide the oldest one as well, which was quite easy to add. So I did that too. Um, there is a lettering system for tetrads and you'll see that on the row below. This is tet tetrad SO90E. So 90E, well, the nine is from the 900 to 919. The zero is from 080 to 099. But where does the E come from? Well, the E comes from the fact we're in the top left-hand corner of that 10K square. So now I will work my way around the 10K square going from A to Z. A to Z, that's 26. And there's 25 dots in the square. Yes, but we don't use the letter O. So if I go down to the bottom left, the bottom left hand tetrad in a square, as you can see now, SO90A. Up one, SO90B. Up one, C. Up one, D. Up one, E. Down to the bottom and across, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, P, because we don't use O, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Right, hope everyone saw that. Um, While I've been moving the pointer around in the map, there was text changing in the area where the, the cursor is circling around now. So I'll go back to where I was. SO90E, this is actually one of my favorite tetrads. It is the square within which lies Butterfly Conservation's rough bank reserve. So what it's saying for this square at the moment is left mouse button click 4.043 Stigmella Lemnicella, right mouse button click 4.049 Stigmella Aenu Faciella. Um, that is because in the checklist order, the previous species that has been recorded in that square is 4.043. The next species, which has been recorded there, is 4.049. So I will keep clicking the right hand mouse button, doing once, twice, three times, four times, keep doing it. And as you see, every time the species changes, it has still been recorded in that square. Well, actually, um, it has been recorded in some period or other, but I could, if I changed the period of years for which the records are shown, it would only find species shown in that appropriate period. 
So I've put the cursor back to where I select the period and I'll lock out 2020. So now I'm only showing species for which there are pre-2020 records. And oh, um, think of a species that was recorded in Rough Bank in 2020. And yes, um, there was one quite scarce one. Which one was it called? Trying to remember the name of it. Um, it was a year first. Um, it's annoying when you when you're trying to remember something, your brain goes blank. It will come to me. I'll choose. I'll, I'll just ignore that for the moment. Um, I'll just carry on clicking on that rough bank square. And as you can see, there's always a blue dot there. I'll choose. Oh, I know what I can choose. I'll just show pre 2000 records or um, pre 2010 records. Yes, that'll do. Because there were some species recorded in rough bank prior to 2010. But butterfly conservation didn't buy the site until 2012. So nearly all, all of the species recorded there were recorded post 2012. So now when I click on that square, I only get species recorded with a solid black dot or an open black dot. And the statistics up in the top right hand corner show that there were actually 53 species recorded in that tetrad prior to 2010. And indeed in that 10k square, a grand total of 604 species prior to 2010. But if I go back to showing records from all years, 700 species recorded from tetrad 90e and 935 from the 10k square. Well, as, as well as limiting this by the year period shown, you can limit it by macros or micros if you want to. So let's just look at the number of micros and go back down to the rough bank square. And now it's showing that, ah, oh, well, yes, it gives the number of micros and macros in, in brackets behind the number of species. But you can also restrict it to just rare and scarce species. And now it's saying there are 45 rare or scarce species, of which 41 are micros and four are macros. And in the 10k square as a whole, 78 rare and scarce species, of which 68 are micros and 10 are macros. Um, There's another checkbox here that says locally spare, scarce species. What is a locally scarce species? Well, um, I say a species is locally scarce in Gloucestershire if the total number of tetrads it's been recorded in in Gloucestershire is at most, well, you can choose a number, anything from one to 10. And I'm scrolling the mouse wheel to scroll that between one and 10 at the moment. I'll leave it on the initial setting of five. If I click on that box and go back over there, over the rough bank square, it's now saying there are five locally scarce species recorded in that tetrad. So if I click on the button, mouse button, it's only showing, well, that's the species density map, which is itself only showing locally scarce species at the moment. And there are one, two, three, four, sorry, one, two, three micro species. So I've limited myself to micros and there's only three of those. If I said both macros and micros, 
it gets me two macros as well, which are Kent Black Arches and Bilberry Tor um no, and um, Slender Burnished Brass. That's an interesting one, because I think that was not actually recorded on the reserve, but recorded in the nearby village in the same tetrad. How are we doing? Right. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum. The, in the information below the map shows typical larval food and the verification comment, if any. I mentioned verific verification criteria earlier. And if I go back to the start and start scrolling through until I find a species for which, here we go. Here is a species for which the national verification criteria include a comment. And so within the square brackets that I'm hovering underneath now, so the adult is a grade two, um, the leaf mine is accepted, and there is a verification comment. So yes, this is a, a very common little micro moth that's, um, it's a beautiful plain metallic gold color with a scattering of bright red and bright purple individual scales. And some, in, some specimens of this moth look absolutely brilliant. Um, I always reckon that um, if the Russian jeweler Fabergé had designed a moth brooch, he might have chosen this species to make a solid gold brooch dotted with a mixture of um, sapphires and, um, and um, maybe rubies or garnets. Um, anyway, um, the comment below, typical UK larval food, oak, because it only uses oak. Species verification comment, confusion with fly mines, um, because it's mine on oak is similar to the mines made by some flies. Um, people that record moth species by looking for their mines need always to remember that there are plenty of other insects that make mines. And some of the mines, mines made by other insects, whether they be flies or beetles, can look very similar to the mines made by moths. So, in some cases, it's necessary to rear the adult from the mine. And if you try doing that, be prepared for a disappointment. Um, if you try and rear the adult from a mine, well, um, it may not survive because it may not like the conditions in which you've kept the leaf. It may not survive because unknowingly to you, it's already left the mine or it's already, already died within the mine. Or if something does emerge from the mine, more often than not, it may turn out to be a parasitic insect, a parasitic wasp or a parasitic fly rather than the moth you were hoping for. You have to be um, ready to uh, accept this as just a fact of recording life. Um. But as I was saying um, select earlier, you can select by larval foods, but there is a bit of a limitation to this. So here we have a species whose larval food is oak and is only oak. So if I clear the text in the selection box and type in oak and click on food and then click on find matches, all you can see is the first species in the checklist for which oak is listed as its food plant, and it's this species. Surprise, surprise, because it's right near the start of the list. Excuse me while I take a drink. Now, if I open that box, I get a huge list of literally dozens and dozens of species. 
I haven't counted them. Um, and that doesn't even include all of the oak feeders. That just includes those species which are, are only use oak or for which the text that I've put in there as the UK larval food indicates that oak is one of the main species they use. There are some species for which the text that I've put in is something like um, deciduous trees or deciduous trees and shrubs. So I'll type that in. And deciduous trees. Um, so the first match for that is um, in Curvaria pectinia, one of the um, early season moths, which is a daytime flyer. So it's larval food. If we look down at the bottom, deciduous trees, I put brackets, birch and hazel. So that's because in the books that I got this information from, birch and hazel were listed as some of the prime species used by this moth. And um, then in, in this case, the caterpillar drops out of the tree and ends up feeding in leaf litter. Um, I pick one of the other species that uses oak. Sorry, it, which uses deciduous trees and shrubs. Um, this is one of the common tortrix moths that you'll see um, often if you do trapping, you might see it in the daytime. And if I scroll through the matching species, often just says deciduous trees. Uh -huh. Okay, it doesn't actually say deciduous trees and shrubs for much. The other Incovaria species is one that it does. Oh, hang on. Now, when I was scrolling earlier, I was looking at the um, text in the find matches box, not at the text below the map. That's where to look. So where the pointer is hovering now, so that's saying things like deciduous trees and shrubs. So hawthorn, blackthorn, other deciduous trees and shrubs. Yeah. So you can use this as a way of finding species that use particular food plants, but um, it works best for species which only use a single plant. So if you put in, say, the word greenweed and find the matches for that, let's see what we get for that. Um, the laburnum leaf miner, which also uses Dyer's greenweed. Um, this one, which uses Dyer's greenweed and also hairy greenweed, which I'm not sure we've got in the county and Petty Wynn, which we've only got a tiny amount of in the county. This one uses gorse and green weeds. This really common one uses gorse, broom and green weeds. This one uses bird's foot trefoil and green weeds question mark. Um, that's because in some cases, the books that I use to get the food information indicate that it's thought that certain certain food plants might be used. Or in some cases, there's a comment that certain plants are used on the continent, but they're not known to be used in the UK. But that doesn't mean to say they're not used in the UK. So anyway, so you can select a species using its common name, using its scientific name, or possibly using its food. I'll stop for a break in a minute, but I'll just say that for some species, there's a 
a box over the top left corner of the map, and you can see one for this species. Several reports to 1929, it says for this one. Now, why does it say that? Well, when I first did the maps, I wanted to show something for those species that we had historical records, but nothing actually mappable in the database, no tetrad mappable records. And I was working from Roger Gaunt's published list of moths recorded in the county. He published one list in 2000 and another one in 2006, an update to it. And he was using information from earlier lists and then records sent to him. He became the moth recorder sometime in the 1990s, I think. Um, and I produced a number of maps for him, um, with specially written programs, and then I offered to produce maps for everything if he gave me a copy of the database, which he didn't, did in 2010. And these maps are a descendant of those 2010 ones. So as of 2010, there weren't any county records that were mappable for this species. So I just put the comment, several reports to 1929. And um, when a record did appear, well, I think for a few species, when records started to appear, I removed the earlier comments and then I got fed up with doing that. So I just left those comments in. So that gives you an indication of the fact that this species, although the only mapped record is since 2010, actually, if I hover over the, the dot in the Vice County area, you'll see that that was recorded in 2013. And you can see, yes, that's about where it appears on the scale to the left of it. But that wasn't the first county record because there were several old historical records. Um, if you find you've recorded something and there isn't a map for it, that should mean it's a new record for the county. Or it might mean you haven't identified it correctly. Um, that is a mistake we all fall into do not be worried if this happens to you. We've all been there, done that. You think you've recorded something really new, really special, uh, and then you get all disappointed when you, you realize you got all excited over, over a, a mistake. But keep, keep at it, keep recording, because one day you'll record something that you'll get excited about because you think it's something brand new for the county and you will be right. And it's really good when you get that feeling, yes, you recorded something new for the county. Been there, done that. And quite a lot of us have. Since the year 2000, more than 160 new species have rec been recorded in the county, and more than 40 people have found those species. It isn't just those of us that do a lot of recording. 